Greetings and welcome back to our 303 and Senior English A. We are now uh, going to introduce ourselves to the great Jonathan Swift. I'm with you on page 438, 439. We're going to be looking at a cutting from Gulliver's Travels. But first we want to introduce ourselves to Swift himself. Notice your dates on page 639, 1667 to 1745, considered the greatest prose satirist. Let's go ahead and circle that word satirist. We know, of course, of this term from our study of Geoffrey Chaucer. Satirist, right? In the English language, Swift is celebrated today for his most famous works, the novel Gulliver's Travels and the essay A Modest Proposal, both of which will we, we study. In his own day, however, Swift was equally well known as a political pamphleteer and as a religious leader who served for more than 30 years as Dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, Ireland. Let's learn about his childhood and early years. Swift was born in Dublin, Ireland to English parents. His start was not promising as his father, a lawyer, had died two months previously. Without any way to make a living, Swift's mother had difficulty providing for her infant son, and they descended into poverty. To complicate the situation, Swift was often sick. Later, he was diagnosed with Menard's disease, an inner ear condition that causes dizziness and hearing loss. The disease would affect, uh, afflict Swift during his entire life. To help her son, Swift's mother sent him to live with his uncle, a successful lawyer. The uncle enrolled Swift in what was likely the best grammar school in Ireland at the time. When he turned 14, Swift entered Trinity College in Dublin, earning his degree five years later. So you can see, very, very brilliant, 14 years old, he's already ready to go to Trinity. Political unrest in Ireland drove him to England, where his mother found him a job as an assistant to the respected English statesman, Sir William Temple. Impressed with Swift's intelligence and work ethic, Temple entrusted him with increasingly more important responsibilities. In 1695, Swift returned to Ireland and became an Anglican priest. In 1699, he found work as a minister to a small congregation near London. For the next decade, Swift ministered, wrote, gardened, and preached. In 1702, he received his Doctor of Divinity degree from Trinity College. Now we're back to this word satirist. In 1704, Swift released The Tale of a Tub and The Battle of the Books. The former satirizes excesses, excesses in religion and learning. The latter is a satiric comic encounter between ancient and modern literature. Although Swift published these books, as well as much of his writing, anonymously, his authorship was widely known. The satirical writing was out of character for a clergyman, but his brilliance was widely acknowledged and his fame spread to London ambition and achievement. Swift's political allegiance shifted in 1710 when he left the Whig Party to join the Tory Party, which was favored by Queen Anne. He benefited immediately from this move as the leading writer for the government. He published some of the most famous and biting political pamphlets of the day. Pamphlet would be like for today what you might think of as a blog. Okay? The later years. After the death of Queen Anne in 1714 and the fall of the Tories from power, Swift's political career in England was over and he returned to Ireland. Although he failed to achieve his goal of becoming a bishop in the Church of England, Swift remained a staunch defender of the Anglican faith. He took the post of dean at St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, where he wrote Gulliver's Travels. His caustic wit continued to burn brightly as shown in his 1729 essay, A Modest Proposal, a savage satire on starvation in Ireland. Its biting power still shakes up readers nearly 300 years after its publication, and we've given a full lecture on that one, and we say as much in that lecture. In 1742, Swift suffered a stroke and lost the ability to speak. On October 19, 1745, he died and was buried in St. Patrick's Cathedral. His death deprived the world of a generous and learned man who despised fanaticism, selfishness, and pride. Let's go to page 440 about Gulliver's Travels. The story behind Gulliver's Travels. The novel had its origin as a humorous assignment from the Scribblers Club, a group of Swift's sharp-witted literary friends. These writers, who delighted in making fun of literary pretensions, gave Swift the assignment of writing a series of amusing imaginary journeys because they knew he enjoyed reading travel books. Overview of the novel. 
Reacting to the violent intolerance displayed by the religious and political figures of his time, Swift ridiculed those whose pride overcame their reason. His novels travel, his novel travels into several remote nations of the world in four parts by Lemuel Gulliver, first a surgeon and then a captain of several ships, commonly called Gulliver's Travels, satirizes such intolerance by means of four imaginary voyages of Lemuel Gulliver, the narrator, a well-educated but unimaginative ship surgeon. The four voyages are part one, a voyage to Lilliput, part two, a voyage to Brobdingnag, part three, a voyage to Laputia and the surrounding areas, part four, a voyage to the country of the Hoyamans. Focus on Lilliput. In a voyage to Lilliput, this is where we're going to be focusing, Swift created the Lilliputians, who are only six inches tall. He uses the tiny Lilliputians to reduce the importance of people in general and politicians in particular. Focusing on disputes between the Church of England and Roman Catholicism, he called the followers of each Little Enders and Big Enders, respectively. In this section of the novel, Swift also satirizes the religious wars between Protestant England and Catholic France, disguising them as a conflict between Lilliput and Lefiscu, an attack on the Whig party. On one level, Gulliver's Travels is a travel book filled with thrilling and exotic adventures, which is why children often know about this story. Some of you commented already, oh, I know all about this because I saw it as a child. On another level, however, the novel satirizes how people can be narrow-minded and even cruel. Swift reserves special venom for politicians who belong to the Whig party. Why did Swift detest the Whigs? Swift's hostility started when he became involved in English politics on behalf of the, on behalf of the Irish church. As the envoy for the Irish bishops, Swift worked to persuade Queen Anne and the Whigs to give some much-needed financial assistance to the Irish church. When they turned Swift down by refusing to help his people, he turned his talents and allegiance to the other main political party, the Tories. Swift's contemporaries would recognize many events in Gulliver's travels as representative of problems in the Whig government. For example, at the end of the excerpt you're about to read, uh, Rel Dressel, the Lilliputian political uh, principal secretary, forces Gulliver to swear his allegiance to the Lilliputian emperor. Swift uses this event to satirize the ridiculous issue that the Whigs created over the credentials of the Tory ambassadors who signed the Treaty of Yurton. A classic endures. Swift wrote Gulliver's Travels to comment on his era, but if that were all the novel were about, it would long ago have vanished into obscurity. The novel was an immediate success. It has never been out of print. Its popularity arises from its insightful portrayal of humanity and of our potential to set aside our differences and achieve some measure of harmony. Okay, let's go to the reading and the background information on 441. Swift's era was marked by religious and political conflicts and intolerance. His novel, Gulliver's Travels, satirizes this intolerance using fictional characters and countries as analogies. This excerpt begins after Gulliver has been released from captivity by the Lilliputians, a race of people who are only six inches tall. Okay, here we go. Let's introduce ourselves now. Pay particular attention as we read, and let's enjoy a little bit of the satire. Overview of the novel. Reacting to the violent intolerance displayed by the religious and political figures of his time, Swift ridiculed those whose pride overcame their reason. His novel travels into several remote nations of the world in four parts by Lemuel Gulliver, first a surgeon and then a captain of several ships, commonly called Gulliver's Travels, satirizes such intolerance by means of four imaginary voyages of Lemuel Gulliver, the narrator, a well-educated but unimaginative ship surgeon. The four voyages are Part 1, A Voyage to Lilliput Part 2, A Voyage to Brobdingnag Part 3, A Voyage to Laputa, Balnabarbi, Lugnag, Glubdubdrin, and Japan Part 4, A Voyage to the Country of the Haugahims Focus on Lilliput In A Voyage to Lilliput, Swift created the Lilliputians, who are only six inches tall 
He uses the tiny Lilliputians to reduce the importance of people in general, and politicians in particular. Focusing on disputes between the Church of England and Roman Catholicism, he called the followers of each Little Indians and Big Indians, respectively. In this section of the novel, Swift also satirizes the religious wars between Protestant England and Catholic France, disguising them as a conflict between Lilliput and Blafuski. An Attack on the Quig Party On one level, Gulliver's Travels is a travel book filled with thrilling and exotic adventures. On another level, however, the novel satirizes how people can be narrow-minded and even cruel. Swift reserved special venom for politicians who belonged to the Whig Party. A classic endures. Swift wrote long ago have vanished into obscurity. Jonathan Swift, born 1667, died 1745. And author and a principal secretary he granted me but with a special charge to do no hurt either to the inhabitants request I made, after author and a principal secretary, concerning the affairs of that empire, the author's offers to serve the emperor in his wars. The first request I made, after I had obtained my liberty, was that I might have license to see Mildendo, the metropolis, which the emperor easily granted me, but with a special charge to do no hurt either to the inhabitants or their houses. The people had notice, by proclamation, of my design to visit the town. The wall which encompassed it is two feet and a half high, and at least eleven inches broad, so that a coach and horses may be driven very safely round it, and it is flanked with strong towers at ten feet distance. I stepped over the great western gate, and passed very gently, and sidling, through the two principal streets, only in my short waistcoat, for fear of damaging the roofs and eaves of the houses with the skirts of my coat. I walked with the utmost circumspection to avoid treading on any stragglers who might remain in the streets, although the orders were very strict that all people should keep in their houses at their own peril. The garret windows and tops of houses were so crowded with spectators that I thought in all my travels I had not seen a more populous place. The city is an exact square, each side of the wall being 500 feet long. The two great streets, which run across and divided into four quarters, are five feet wide. The lanes and alleys, which I could not enter, but only view them as I passed, are from twelve to eighteen inches. The town is capable of holding five hundred thousand souls. The houses are from three to five stories. The shops and markets well provided. The emperor's palace is in the center of the city, where the two great streets meet. It is enclosed by a wall of two feet high and twenty feet distance from the buildings. I had His Majesty's permission to step over this wall, and, the space being so wide between that and the palace, I could easily view it on every side. The outward court is a square of forty feet, and includes two other courts. In the inmost are the royal apartments, which I was very desirous to see, but found it extremely difficult, for the great gates, from one square into another, were but eighteen inches high and seven inches wide, now the buildings of the outer court were at least five feet high, and it was impossible for me to stride over them without infinite damage to the pile, though the walls were strongly built of hewn stone and four inches thick. At the same time the emperor had a great desire that I should see the magnificence of his palace, but this I was not able to do till three days after, which I spent in cutting down with my knife some of the largest trees in the royal park, about a hundred yards distant from the city. Of these trees I made two stools, each about three feet high and strong enough to bear my weight. The people, having received notice a second time, I went again through the city to the palace with my two stools in my hands. When I came to the side of the outer court, I stood upon one stool and took the other in my hand. This I lifted over the roof and gently set it down on the space between the first and second court, which was eight feet wide. I then stepped over the building very conveniently from one stool to the other, and drew up the first after me with a hooked stick. By this contrivance I got into the inmost court, and, lying down upon my side, I applied my face to the windows of the middle stories, which were left open on purpose, and discovered the most splendid apartments that can be imagined. There I saw the empress and the young princess in their several lodgings, with their chief attendants about them. Her Imperial Majesty was pleased to smile very graciously upon me, and gave me out of the window her hand to kiss. But I shall not anticipate the reader with further descriptions of this kind, 
because I reserve them for a greater work, which is now almost ready for the press, containing a general description of this empire from its first erection through a long series of princes, with a particular account of their wars and politics, laws, learning, and religion, their plants and animals, their peculiar manners and customs, with other matters very curious and useful. My chief design at present being only to relate such events and transactions as happened to the public or to myself during a residence of about nine months in that empire. One morning, about a fortnight after I had obtained my liberty, Reldrasal, principal secretary, as they styled him, for private affairs, came to my house attended only by one servant. He ordered his coach to wait at a distance, and desired I would give him an hour's audience, which I readily consented to, on account of his quality and personal merits, as well as of the many good offices he had done me during my solicitations at court. I offered to lie down that he might the more conveniently reach my ear, but he chose rather to let me hold him in my hand during our conversation. He began with compliments on my liberty, said he might pretend to some merit in it, but, however, added, that if it had not been for the present situation of things at court, perhaps I might not have obtained it so soon. For, said he, as flourishing a condition as we may appear to be in to foreigners, we labor under two mighty evils, a violent faction at home, and the danger of an invasion by a most potent enemy from abroad. As to the first, you are to understand, that for about seventy moons past there have been two struggling parties in this empire, under the names of Tremixen and Slamixen, from the high and low heels of their shoes, by which they distinguish themselves. It is alleged, indeed, that the high heels are most agreeable to our ancient constitution, but, however this be, His Majesty has determined to make use only of low heels in the administration of the government, and all offices in the gift of the crown, as you cannot but observe, and particularly that His Majesty's imperial heels are lower at least by a drawer than any of his court. Drawer is a measure about the fourteenth part of an inch. The animosities between these two parties run so high that they will neither eat, nor drink, nor talk with each other. We compute the Tramixen, or high heels, to exceed us in number, but the power is wholly on our side. We apprehend His Imperial Highness, the heir to the crown, to have some tendency towards the high heels. At least we can plainly discover that one of his heels is higher than the other, which gives him a hobble in his gait. Now, in the midst of these intestine disquiets, we are threatened with an invasion from the island of Blefuscu, which is the other great empire of the universe, almost as large and powerful as this of his majesty. For as to what we have heard you affirm, that there are other kingdoms and states in the world inhabited by human creatures as large as yourself, our philosophers are in much doubt, and would rather conjecture that you dropped from the moon, or one of the stars, because it is certain that a hundred mortals of your bulk would in a short time destroy all the fruits and cattle of his majesty's dominions. Besides, our histories of six thousand moons make no mention of any other regions than the two great empires of Lilliput and Lefusco, which two mighty powers have, as I was going to tell you, been engaged in a most obstinate war for six and thirty moons past. It began upon the following occasion. It is allowed on all hands that the primitive way of breaking eggs before we eat them was upon the larger end. But his present majesty's grandfather, while he was a boy, going to eat an egg, and breaking it according to the ancient practice, happened to cut one of his fingers, whereupon the emperor his father published an edict, commanding all his subjects, upon great penalties, to break the smaller end of their eggs. The people so highly resented this law that our histories tell us there have been six rebellions raised on that account, wherein one emperor lost his life, and another his crown. These civil commotions were constantly fomented by the monarchs of Lefusco, and when they were quelled, the exiles always fled for refuge to that empire. It is computed that eleven thousand persons have at several times suffered death rather than submit to break their eggs at the smaller end. Many hundred large volumes have been published upon this controversy, but the books of the big Indians have long been forbidden, and the whole party rendered incapable by law of holding employments. During the course of these troubles, the emperors of Lefuscu did frequently expostulate by their ambassadors, accusing us of making a schism in religion, by offending against a fundamental doctrine of our great prophet Lustrog in the 54th chapter of the Blundekral, which is their Alcoran. This, however, is thought to be a mere strain upon the text, for the words are these, 
that all true believers break their eggs at the convenient end, and which is the convenient end seems, in my humble opinion, to be left to every man's conscience, or at least in the power of the chief magistrate to determine. Now, the big Indian exiles have found so much credit in the emperor of Blefuscu's court, and so much private assistance and encouragement from their party here at home, that a bloody war has been carried on between the two empires for six and thirty moons, with various success, during which time we have lost forty capital ships, and a much greater number of smaller vessels, together with thirty thousand of our best seamen and soldiers, and the damage received by the enemy is reckoned to be somewhat greater than ours. However, they have now equipped a numerous fleet, and are just preparing to make a descent upon us, and his imperial majesty, placing great confidence in your valor and strength, has commanded me to lay this account of his affairs before you. I desire the secretary to present my humble duty to the emperor, and to let him know that I thought it would not become me, who was a foreigner, to interfere with parties, but I was ready, with the hazard of my life, to defend his person and state against all invaders. Okay, uh, let's turn now to uh, what, what makes this satire. Well, at 2A, at the most obvious level, we're going to be making fun of the idea that people can get so bent out of shape over the silliness that occurs that, of course, we're going to fight over really foolish divisions between us which end of the egg one should break. Of course, the reader for Swift will look at this and say, nobody would ever go to war over something as stupid as that. And yet, of course, Swift is going to raise an eyebrow and say, are you so sure about that? Because it seems awfully strange in the history of humans that we fight over the stupidest stuff. And of course, we can do this at the large level. We can also do this at the at the um, small, at the intimate level, uh, within friends. I mean, if you think about it, we fight over some pretty.